Good morning, folks. So, how's lab one going? Who's finished? Yeah, almost, most people are finished. Good, okay. And uh, uh, some people, therefore, will start lab two today <laughs> um, or soon. So, I thought I'd go over some of the details lab two probably won't finish today. So in, in lab two, you're going to build a parallel computer that solves differential equations. And you're going to put that parallel computer under control of the HPS. So this is related to, in fact, it was originally motivated in my mind by um, trying to make the FPGA behave like an analog computer. An analog computer is a device where you wire together voltage integrators, voltage differentiators, and uh, adders to solve differential equations, mostly. And so I wanted to see if I could get that same sort of operation on the FPGA. It solves differential equations uh, of order n in complexity 1. In other words, it is completely parallel. And therefore, for reasonable size systems, can probably outperform the HPS. The Small, the, I would guess that the size of the FPGA we have can put around a hundred integrators on the, on the chip. So you could solve something like an array of 50 second order equations. Like 50 spring mass systems, maybe more, using this scheme. But I'm not going to ask you to do something that complicated. I'm going to ask you to solve a system that <clears throat> looks like this, where you have a couple of rigid walls, one at x minus 1 and one at x plus 1. And inside that region, there are two masses. We'll call them equal mass. And we can, without loss of generality, I love that word, love that phrase, set mass equal to 1. But the spring constants are arbitrary and the solution of this is given by, by differential equations. If the springs are linear, in other words, they're hook law springs, Remember that from physics long ago? Hooke's Law. Then, then the, uh, you can write out the linear equation as just uh, the acceleration is equal to some sum of forces. <clears throat> where you, so where you're doing the free body uh, force diagram for, for, for mass 1 and mass 2 separately and including a damping term which is proportional to velocity. That simulates a viscous damping in air or water. And um, you're going to set it to some small value, but non-zero value for numerical reasons. <clears throat> These equations you can trivially solve using Laplace transforms. You know, it's like 20 minutes to solve those using Laplace transforms. So to make it more interesting, I'm going to have you optionally include a cube law term where the force due to the spring is going to be given by some k1 times the displacement plus some k13 times the displacement cubed. Makes the system nonlinear. You can no longer solve it in closed terms. You have to simulate it. And this cube law is a sort of first order approximation 
to a real spring that as you compress it or extend it gets stiffer because you're actually deforming the steel. So this is kind of a slightly higher level, uh, higher uh, uh, level approximation of a spring. Makes the behavior of this system far more complicated. But no harder to compute if you are simulating it. So, what do we need to do to simulate those equations? Well, we need a number system that's going to make sense. You're used to thinking in floating point, but floating point is too bulky, so we're going to use fixed point. We need an integrator. We need a, a module, a, a piece of Verilog that will do a numerical integration. And we need a piece of Verilog code that will do a signed fixed point multiply. Adding comes for free with uh, uh, fixed points, so we don't really need to do anything to, to enable that. We may need some other functions, but for the purposes of these equations, you have to be able to add, subtract, multiply by constants, except here, where you have to multiply a variable, and integrate. So, As always, the very first thing you do is simulate in MATLAB because it's easy to modify and easy to correct. Oh boy, I got to get my pinching more accurate. And I, I, these are these show the normal modes for the for the system. The the uh, asymmetric mode and the symmetric mode, where the masses, if if all the k's are the same. There's a mode where the masses move like this, and there's another mode where they breathe. Those are the two modes, the eigen modes. But the MATLAB program you want to use is down here in this section called development process. First, start by simulating it. And the the, the system we're going to use for fixed point arithmetic has a dynamic range of plus minus one. It actually has a little bit of an overflow region. It'll actually go to plus minus two. But you should keep all your variables within the range plus minus one, corresponding to the size of the walls. So the masses can't go outside plus minus one, and the velocities can't be greater than plus or minus one distance unit per time step. So, the very first thing you're going to do in MATLAB is to make sure that the constants you choose satisfy the condition that all of the velocities, which are plotted faintly here, and all of the positions, which are plotted heavily here, fall in the range of minus one to plus one. The next thing you're going to do then is to write out a Verilog, a set of Verilog modules, which we'll get around to defining. You're going to write a set of Verilog modules, which you will then simulate in model sim until the result you get in model sim matches the MATLAB. And I wrote a little. I wrote a little page about model sim, and in particular for, for the version of model sim we're using, you can set the output variables in the, in the waveform viewer to be analog, so you can actually get the period and the amplitude of the sine waves that you are <laughs> simulating. 
And you're going to need to do that. Don't even bother to whip out the FPGA until, until the model sim works. Oh, and by the way, the nicest way I've found to convert from MATLAB floating point constants, which you will need to do, into Verilog is something like this. If the constant's greater than zero, print the first thing. If the constant's less than zero, print the second thing. And that'll convert floating point into 2.16 fixed point. 2.16. So 2.16 fixed point, we're using 18-bit words. So there's the ones place, the halves place, the quarters place, down to the 2 to the minus 16th place. The binary point is right here, and this is the sign bit. We're working in two's complement, and you're going to convert all the constants and all the variables into two's complement 18 bit 2.16 format, because that's what my code assumes. Some things are easier to, to convert than others, but let's see, someplace, I think, yes, I re read the DDA page, direct uh, digital differential analyzer. I, I linked up a bunch of stuff here including how you solve a system of equations, which you're going to need, to need to do because each second order equation becomes two first order equations. And a number system. So one, so there, there's the decimal equivalent, these are the hexadecimal equivalents. As we step down factors of two, we're moving the bit one to the right every time. And then the, the two's complement you get in the usual fashion, although uh, it turns out you don't have to specify the two's complement of a, of, a, um, of a constant in, in Verilog as I talked about last time. But what we're going to do is to is to simulate any questions? Yeah. Uh, so you said that everything has to be bounded by plus minus one. Yes. And the distance units are walls? So like Minus one is left wall, plus one is right wall? Mm -hmm. or what's loss or time? Is that like cycles or is it just arbitrary? So you're asking how to scale time, and that's a very good question. You have to scale time such that the so that such the dx dt never goes above one or below minus one. So it's more guess and check. It is not guess and check! <laughs> you can do this analytically. I'll show you how. We're not there yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve a set of equations of this form. D -d dv dt equals some function of t and v. These may be vectors. Okay, v may be a vector. And what we're going to do is an Euler approximation of this because it's easy. It's not accurate, but it's easy. And the Euler approximation is going to be that V of n plus 1 minus V of n over delta T is equal to F of T and Vn. So it's a first order forward derivative. If we know Vn, 
we can rearrange this so that we know Vn plus 1. So what we're going to do, one part of what we're going to do is to write an integrator that solves for Vn plus 1 as Vn plus delta T times F of T V N. Anybody remember what the differential equation is called if the function is not a function of time? It's called autonomous. All right. Most of what we're going to be doing is autonomous. But but this works this method works for for uh, general functions. So the basis of the numerical integration then is that there's going to have to be some function that I can't specify but you're going to write that that feeds into this equation it's going to get multiplied by dt so a multiplier perhaps the output of this then is going to get fed into a, an adder which it feeds a register which is has a oh wait a minute that's I have to be a little more careful than that which feeds a mux which takes the reset signal and feeds in an initial condition. If you're in reset, you have to feed in an initial condition because every integration requires an initial condition, right? So if we're in reset mode, we take the initial condition typically for, for this exercise it'll be a position between minus 1 and plus 1 with velocity 0 but it doesn't have to be this then is going to feed into a register which will be Vn plus 1 at the output there is a obviously a clock that has to tick to load that register and this output then will also be fed back into the adder. So the basic structure of the numerical integrator is exactly this, which we need to convert to Verilog. Not a big problem. And all we need is a multiplier. Yeah. You assuming dt is defined to be one? No, no, not at all. It has to be a small number. So, but thank you for reminding me to say this: that if we choose dt carefully. That is to say, it's a negative power of 2, 2 to the minus x, where x is some reasonable number, say 8 or 10. Then we can replace this multiply by a shift right and save a ton of hardware. Because a shift in Verilog just means rename the wires. So, let's say we can summarize this block as a symbol that looks like this, where we have some initial condition that comes in and a derivative in here and an integral coming out here. 
then let's take a simple example and show how we might use these to, to solve the differential equation. Any questions? So, we got, the, so we got the spring mass, the mass is sitting in a bucket of water so it's damped. And as we all remember, we have D, if this is x, we have md squared x dt squared is equal to minus kx, where k is the spring constant, and minus d dx dt, where, let's make that a capital D, so that where d is some sort of dissipation constant, it's the, the amount that you get, it's, it's the viscosity of the, of the fluid, so to speak. And we have to have initial conditions. So, given that we have an integrator, how do we solve this? Well, feedback, of course. <clears throat> so, let's say we, we start by defining an integrator, and let's say that the input of this is x double dot, which is the same as dx dt, d squared x by dt squared. We have some input which is x dot at t equals zero, the initial condition. If this is an integrator, the output here must be x dot. If we integrate this again, with an uh, initial condition of x of 0, the output here must be x. So all we have to do then is multiply the velocity by minus d over m, multiply x by minus k over m, add them together, and we know that must be equal to the acceleration. So we wire a circuit, or we build the circuit in Verilog that looks like this, where with two integrators, two multipliers, and an adder, we give it initial conditions, non-zero initial conditions, say solve, and it produces a sine wave, a damp sine wave. So the output then is going to look like this. Now in the bad old days when I was a freshman, well, it was many years ago. These, these integrators were implemented using op amps. In fact, the reason that op amps are caused, called op amps is that they were originally designed to do mathematical operations, specifically addition and integration, so, you, so that people could solve differential equations. And why did they want to solve differential equations? Sadly, it's because they wanted to aim guns correctly. <clears throat> so these were used as uh, gun computers. And, but because they are running in continuous time, if, if, they're, if they're op amps, they could solve differential equations much faster than the digital computers of the time which were uh, doing a few hundred operations a second or less. But the bandwidth of these is poor. Typically with op amps you'd get a few hundred hertz bandwidth, maybe a few kilohertz bandwidth. You could do much better than that now with digital stuff. Any questions? So, so how do we solve this equation in 
with numerically or mathematically. Well, let's see. We, we could say we, we have the system that will solve dv dt is equal to f of t v1. And we have the same hardware which will do dv2 dt is equal to f of t v1 and v2, v1 and v2. So if we want to convert a second order equation into two first order equations, we can easily do that by noticing that d1 dv1 dt is equal to v2. If we identify v1 as x and v2 is defined as x dot. So one of the differential, so if we decompose this equation into two first order differential equations, the first one is going to be this, and the second one, dv2 dt, is going to be minus k over m v1 minus d over m v2. So now we know how to put these things together. I wrote, <coughs> excuse me, I wrote a little snippet of code which talks about how to do this. I was going to send you back to the DDA page and look at the second order modularized whatever solver thing or that you, but then I realized you use an IS2 and that would be misleading and useless. So I abstracted from it a uh, code snippet which shows you how to wire up this digital differential analyzer to solve a second order equation. So we're going to set the time step to 2 to the minus 9. And then the, f the first differential equation, which I put in, in um, Euler form up there, turns into some integrator whose output is V1, whose input is V2, initial condition is 0, a D delta T of 2 shifted 9, and there's some analog clock which will set the clock rate. And an analog reset signal which is necessary to load the initial condition into the output of the integrator. So there's got to be an integrator module that has an output, an input, so on. The second integrator then is going to have an output V2 and oh my god, what in the hell is that? So there's no way to make nice wires in, in Verilog, sign, uh, uh, named wires. So we're going to do a signed multiply whose output value is V1 times K over M. And we're going to multiply together. The inputs are going to be V1 and the constant 1. So that sets K over M equal to 1. And as we all know then, if you remember back, oh, the solution of the differential equation is that the natural frequency of the system is given by the square root of k over m. Sound familiar? Does that, yeah, I'm knocking a neuron loose. <clears throat> so this means that the system will, will run at one radian per time unit. If k over m is one, it runs at one radian per time unit. The time unit is 2 to the ninth computational steps. Because I set dt to be 2 to the minus 9. Then we're going to do a sign multiply v2 times d over m, which is whose inputs are v2 and 
some small number. Oh, golly, what is that? That's, uh, um, 1 16th, right? Zero. No, it's 1 32nd. 1 32nd. So that has a value of 1 32nd. We take these two outputs, V1 KM, negate that. Subtract off this product, integrate with V2 as output with initial condition 0 and shift left a DT of shift lefted by 9. Oh, both of the, both of the initial conditions are 0. This is going to be a really boring solution. It'll be a correct solution. It'll just be boring because it'll just sit there at 0. So, <clears throat> we clearly need to multiply. That's easy. And when you use a multiply that is isolated in a module like this, Quartus correctly infers that you should use a hardware multiplier. So I'm going to ask for an output, 18 bits. Be sure you say the inputs are signed because a signed multiply is not equivalent to an unsigned multiply. And the way it decides is by the signedness of the inputs. There's going to be a wire which is a signed output from the multiplier, but then we have to parse it a little bit because what's going to come out of the multiplier is 32, 36 bits. 36 bits it's an 18 times 18 multiply with the binary point here. You're going to get 36 bits out. The binary point then of the output <coughs> is at bit 31, 32. So the binary point is between bits 31 and 32. <clears throat> so we need two bits from this side and 16 bits from the other side to reconstruct the most significant bits of the output, which is we're going to take the output, bit 35, the sign bit, and concatenate it using the curly brackets with bits 32, which is the ones bit, down to 16, which is the 2 to the minus 16 bit. So we're taking two 18 bits in, we're producing an 18 bit out, and you can see why you have to make sure there's no overflow here. Everything has to be less than 1, because otherwise when you do the multiply, you'll overflow the system. Is it clear what's happening? It's a nice, easy thing to, to uh, instantiate. The integrator is also fairly simple. <clears throat> We're going to specify an output, the function input, the initial output, DT clock and reset as I said and always at the pause edge of the clock this is now the analog clock this is not the system state clock this is the analog clock which you get to choose to scale time the way you like it if the reset line is low, oh, I made this negative reset, uh, then, then V1 gets the initial output just copied over. Otherwise, V1 gets V new. And then when I wrote this, I was separating out um, register updates from combinatorial. So V1 new is equal to V1 plus the function shifted by DT. 
three shifts? Remember what that does in Verilog? Shifts it a bit and a half. <laughs> no. no. It, it, it does a signed right. It does arithmetic right shift. But here's the trick. Only if the variables are signed. Otherwise, it just says this fool is doing the wrong thing and reverts back to unsigned shift, which will give you ridiculous answers. So that's the integrator. That's all there is. So th these, this little snippet of code here, this little snippet of code then will solve the second order differential equation approximately because this is only fixed point. It's using only Euler integration. How good is it? Well, it's pretty good. So you could ask how far off are the eigenvalues for a given delta t? In other words, how far off is the frequency? And with a step of 2 to the minus 8, it is off about one part in 400. And at 2 to the minus 9, it's off less than, much less than one part in 400. It's pretty good. Yeah, this is yet another example of approximate computing. We're lowering the number of bits. We're lower, lowering the complexity of the algorithm to at the, at the, at the expense of absolute accuracy. So what you're going to be doing then is to generalize this to four state variables, position one, position two, velocity one, velocity two, four state variables with four integrators, an optional cubic term. You're going to wire this all up and it's going to be under control of the HPS. The HPS has to be able to say, reset, start. It has to be able to say, reset, start. The HPS has to be able to load all three spring constants. And it has to be able to load the cubic spring constant. And something else. So. And the output of this then will be V1 and V2, or in, in, the, in the case of, of your system would be position 1 and position 2. Those then are going to be written through a bus master to the VGA, where they're plotted. Then, <laughs> popping the stack, after you've simulated this to death in, Veril, in, model, in model sim so that you know that the compute algorithm is correct, then you're going to instantiate it on, on the FPGA, but without HPS input. You're just going to use fixed constants and get the VGA bus master working so that you can draw the waveform on the screen. Once you get that done, then you're going to add parallel I.O. ports or other bus slaves to the bus so that you can control the, the computation from the HPS. <coughs> And of course, then you have to write a command interpreter on the, uh, in C that, that, that manipulates all of these memory addresses appropriately to do what you need to do. That's easy. <clears throat> so 
what did I say here? Use an HPSC program to, uh, so on the serial console, you could set four initial conditions, three linear spring constants, start, stop, turn on and off cubic spring term. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> So, any questions? What I am going to do ne first thing next time is to draw out a possible connection scheme for the for the the solver. Oh, we need to talk about time scaling also. Need to talk about time scaling and absolute frequencies. I want you to put out a fairly low frequency so that you can time, so you do some time scaling. I've just been trying to get video input working through the television decoder. Spent all day yesterday trying to make the television decoder clock run and it turned out that the video in IP that shipped with the standard computer didn't generate the reset signal. So I got that fixed and um, I know now how to read a pixel back from the video stream to figure out what you're looking at. But the reason I brought this up is every time I modified QSys and recompiled it was nine and a half minutes of my life. That's just long enough to do something else in between if you take good notes. I suggest you figure out how to do that in lab. So you write down the changes you just made, you hit recompile, you go off and edit the final project report. You wait for the thing to be done, you go back, try and remember what you were doing nine minutes before and see what the result is. This is tedious, folks. Use simulation as much as you can. <clears throat> Simulate a lot, build a little bit. I couldn't simulate this. It's a real time it's a real time module. So I had to end up compiling it six times an hour all day yesterday. Still doesn't work. It's pretty close though. And the and the only so at this point and I figured that somebody's going to want to do this for final project. At this point, on the 640 by 480 screen, I get a 320 by 240 image, which is perfect for television, just exactly the way it should be, except it's duplicated here. Uh, I'll figure it out. <coughs> Pardon me? Could be the back buffer. I don't know what it is. I thought I turned off back buffer, but but uh, I'm not sure that I did. And I'll check on that. Um, so again, you're going to build a parallel solver. It is an example of a coprocessor that you might put attached to the HPS that solves some interesting dynamical system and produces output directly to the VGA. This exercise is you building a bus master which you're going to need for all the rest of the projects. It's a pretty simple bus master because on every write cycle all it has to do is write a point for, for uh, position one and another point for position two. And it exercises then controlling a dynamic system by means of bus 
slaves parallel I.O. ports probably from, from HPS. So I think it gets all the pieces that are necessary for the rest of the course all whooshed into one lab. Starts soon. How many of you ever took a course in Laplace transforms? Nobody? Wow, that used to be required in the 60s for uh, electrical engineers. It's, it allows you to solve linear differential equations using algebraic techniques. Um, doesn't work for nonlinear equations, but then nothing works for nonlinear equations except simulation. They mentioned it in circuits for that. They mentioned it in circuits for, yeah, just barely. So the, so the eigenfunctions for, uh, for a Fourier transform are sines and cosines, right? They're the, they're the basis functions. The basis function for a Laplace transform is a damped sine and cosine. Since it's damped, it must know about time because there has to be a t equals zero where it starts. That's the main difference between a Fourier transform and a Laplace transform. And, but, but the eigenfunctions for lots of linear systems are damped sine waves. Therefore, it's a really nice system for solving differential equations. Anyways, as an experiment, when I was in college, they taught us Laplace transforms for, t for solving differential equations second semester freshman. It's hugely useful. Because my only other calculator was a slide rule. Read this a couple of times. Look at the code snippet. Start, uh, start messing with QSys. Because there's lots of moving parts here. I had one question yesterday, which was, when you, when you refer to the lightweight bus, how does that relate, relate to QSys? Turns out that the HPS lightweight bus is exposed onto QSys, and you can drag a wire from it. So the lightweight bus is part of QSys, on the HPS side, it looks like FF200000. In other words, it's a memory address with the lower four digits being set by the specific peripheral address that you choose in QSIS. So this will be a QSIS address that you append to the general lightweight bus address and that is what you will see on the QSIS side. We'll do this some more next time. I'll see some of you this afternoon.